so I'm going to talk about uh, Mariam Mizahani. So I chose to talk about her because first she's going to give me the occasion to uh, tower, to tour um, a few of the mathematics I love uh, around the hyperbolic geometry. And um, then I was lucky enough to um, to benefit from a conversation with her. And uh, she was an amazing mathematician. And um, my research has been influenced a lot by her. So I am, I am, uh, yeah, she's, she's someone important for me and for the community. So let's uh, start with a short bio of uh, Maria Mizahani. So she was born in 90, um, in 77 in Tehran. Then she attended Sharif University until uh, 99. And then she moved to Harvard and she got a PhD under the supervision of Kurt McMillan. Then she got a job in Princeton, then in Stanford. And she got the Fields Medal in 2014. And uh, if I remember correctly, it was in Korea, right? So I'm going to talk about surfaces, how you build them, how you classify them. Then I'm going to talk about uh, surfaces with geometry. Uh, what does it mean for a surface to have some uh, geometry? And I will concentrate mainly on a hyperbolic geometry. What, is, what does it mean for a surface to be hyperbolic? And um, then that's going to take uh, at least half of the talk. And uh, then I will move to uh, something more specific to Mariam's work, to Mirzakhani's work. The one, the first one is counting curves on surfaces. And the other one is going to be about the space of all surfaces. So I'm going to define it, try to define it a little bit properly. And uh, this is a space that we, most of, uh, I guess, of the audience know as a Tashmir space. So let's start with something very elementary. So what is a surface? So of course, the basic example is that of a plane. But we are topologists for this uh, first half of an hour. And um, uh, we will be allowed to deform the plane. So. Uh, a surface for us, for us, is going to be something, actually a topological space, that locally looks like a plane. For instance, this a sort of a hat is going to be a surface for us. So right now, I seem to emphasize the fact that this surface is inside a three-dimensional space, but of course, the definition is uh, intrinsic. You don't, do not need to see it as part of a bigger space. And uh, one example of a space which is a surface, but um, not naturally embedded into the space, is the space of colors. And uh, you know that because you know, for instance, for uh, you have coordinates on the space of colors, for instance, the uh, RGB, uh, RGB coordinates and um, which are actually barycentric coordinates. So um, this means that here in this situation, uh, you have a surface, something that locally looks like a plane. So there are some uh, examples that you know very well. So uh, one is the torus, uh, the other is a sphere. I will speak a little bit of the torus as a motivation, but I will not speak about the sphere. And other examples, so you may have surfaces with boundary, and uh, you may have infinite surfaces, which are infinitely complicated. But for us, for this talk, I will mainly be interested into closed surfaces. And so what is a closed surface? It's a finite, more precisely compact, and it has no boundary. So here is a little drawing of uh, what a surface could be. So the first thing I will uh, try to do is to explain that surfaces are built out of elementary pieces. So when you start with a surface, we am going to, to explain a process that will uh, transform the surface into elementary blocks. 
So how do you do that? You do that by cutting your surface into smaller pieces. So let's explain the process. The first thing you need to consider are an essential simple curves. So what does this work, this word mean? So you know what a curve is. So uh, simple means that you don't have any self-intersection. That's a definition of being simple. So this curve does not have self-intersection. This one has, so this one is not simple. Then the other condition is uh, of being uh, uh, essential. So being essential, non-essential, it's easier to define, is when your surface bound a disk. So in that context, this surface here. So do you see my uh, arrow? Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, this surface here is non, this curve here is non-essential because non-essential because it bounds a disk. And this one is essential because it doesn't bound a disk. So when you have done that, you can repeat the process. So you can find another essential simple curve. So here is, you need to add some extra condition. So you want that your second curve here does not intersect the previous one. Okay. And the other condition, which is a little bit like essential, essential, uh, to be essential, is the fact that you don't want this curve to be deformed into this one. So this is a curve which is different from this one in a topological sense. It cannot be deformed into this one. So let's repeat the process. So uh, you see that there is another essential simple curve here, which is not like the previous one and does not intersect them. And then you can uh, repeat the process again and you can uh, repeat it. And there is one more curve that you can uh, draw, which is this one. So here, and that's something that you have to show, the process actually uh, finished finishes, is finished. There is no more essential simple curve that you can uh, draw on your surface. So let's consider what happens now if you cut your surface along these curves. So I'm just going to use coloring to have different sort of a, uh, to explain what are the different pieces. So you have uh, one, two, three, four different pieces. And uh, if you, uh, cut along these pieces, you see that your surface, your pieces, they actually look all uh, about the same. And they are what we call surface, a pair of pens. So um, here is a, a little animation that goes quickly about the decomposition of a surface into a pair of pens. So I draw my essential simple curves, all of them, then I color. And I see these four pieces are, are the same thing. They are what are called a pair of pens. So let's uh, do that again because it was a bit fast. And you will see in the end that all the pieces are the same and um, they are uh, exactly a pair of pens. And I glue them back together. Okay. So now the question is so we have uh, uh, filled. Uh, fulfill our goal, which is to uh, find a, to decompose uh, our surface into elementary blocks. So these elementary blocks are very important for uh, people working in a surface theory. They are called pair of pens. So it turned out that you can actually a, uh, do a further operation, which is to cut this pair of pens into el more elementary pieces. So what you do is just you consider the, um, because if you are a, someone who wants to make a pair of pants, you cannot actually obtain that. You need to have flat pieces. So what you do is you make a sewing. Uh, so you have this curve here, this curve here, and this curve here. And if you cut along these uh, curves, you obtain uh, two hexagons. And you can recover your pair of pants by gluing this side to this side, this side to this side, this side to this side. And then uh, gluing them back, respecting some orientation, you have to be careful, you obtain a um, uh, pair of pens. So now we have a complete description of how to build a surface. You start with a many hexagons. 
and uh, then you glue them together to get a, uh, a pair of pants. Then you glue again the pair of pants together to get a closed surface. So on the basic result of a, of a surface topology is to say that every closed, um, connected, oriented surface is, ex is exactly uh, being obtained by this procedure. And the number of hexagons you have to start from is a, is a topological invariant. Okay, but so far, uh, these surfaces, um, um, they are shapeless. So they are with any sort of geometry, you can sort of deform them. So what do I mean by geometry? So geometry is just going to be, uh, to consider this as a metric space. Not any kind of metric space, I will explain. And um, first, I need a metric space, which is I need to define what is the distance between points. And then I also want to have something which is like the Euclidean geometry that we learned at school, at elementary school, that we have this notion of points and lines, which are the shortest paths. And we also have angles, and we also have triangles. So this kind of basic object, what we like in geometry, lines, angles, and triangles. So I want to explain how to, um, to fit some geometry on a closed surface. So let's start with the basic example, the torus, which I cannot be obtained actually by the procedure I explained before. Um, uh, so what is a torus? So uh, how do you build a torus? You start with a flat rectangle with a right angled corner. So you can glue uh, uh, this side with this side and you obtain this tube. And then you can glue the two ends of the tube to obtain a torus. So why do I emphasize the torus as a Euclidean geometry? Just because you can draw lines. So what is a line? So you start, let's say, uh, this is a line, the blue thing. So you start with some line inside this object. And uh, when you arrive here, so this point is identified with this point, you see that your line can be continued this way by a parallel line. So if you want to, happen what, to see what happens around a, a corner here, you see that your line is going to go through maybe different corner, different uh, appearance of your um, uh, of your corner of your tile of your fundamental domain so um, another picture is that you can see this tile as part of a general tiling of r2 and you see that if you identify each tile by projection you see that your line here your blue line is the same thing as a line which is drawn an actual line which is drawn in in R2, and uh, you see uh, the line here as a projection of this line here. Okay, that's an example of Euclidean geometry. And, um, uh, and you can define uh, length, angles, distance, and lines. But now we have run into a problem because I would like to apply this procedure to my surfaces. But my surfaces, I explained they were built by hexagons. And here's the problem. You cannot a, obtain right angle hexagons in Euclidean geometry because, a, because of a, the fact that the sum of the angle of a triangle is equal to uh, two pi. Or oh, pi. Pi, sorry. Um, okay, so actually, here is an example of a Euclidean torus. That uh, those people who have been uh, 20 in the 80s, I hope there are some around, would remember. So this is a game which was played in uh, in cafes or in bars. It was called Asteroids. So let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, play it. So you see that this big rock here, up of it appears on the other side. So it exactly follows, and this one up appears here. So this exactly um, uh, obeys the rules of a torus. So this game was actually played on the torus. So this means that being a mathematician, you could make, you could be working for Atari. 
So, uh, I just explained what is a uh, surface with Euclidean geometry. You have this line, you have lengths and goals. And I, um, I um, explained the problem, which is that there is no right angle hexagons in Euclidean geometry. So, let's start with the uh, metric spaces. So, you all know uh, what are metric spaces, they are fundamental objects in mathematics. So, it means that you have a space and you can obtain a real number, which is the distance between two points. And um, this distance between two points satisfies a lot of uh, very nice property. One of them is the very important triangular inequality, which is this one. I mean, you all know triangular inequality for metric spaces. And this triangular inequality allows you to define what is the length of a curve, any curve, any continuous curve. So what you do here, you, uh, you find a subdivision and you take the length which is a supremum of all the distance, of the sum of the distance between consecutive points along your lines. So I would like to emphasize that this notion of length could well be infinite. That's not a problem for us. And that this doesn't require a, any smoothness or whatnot. This is something that you can do with any metric space. You can always define the length of a curve in any metric space provided that you allow yourself to be infinite, which is not a big problem for us. So uh, when you have the notion of a length of a curve, you have a notion of a geodesic, which is going to be the path of shortest length. So we all know that the path, a path of shortest length um, this is going to be a line in Euclidean geometry. So that's going to be our uh, generalization of line, just geodesics. And uh, maybe I should say here that in a general metric space, there always exists at least one geodesic, but um, provided it's a, the, it's a path connected, but uh, this uh, um, uh, geodesic might not be unique. Okay, so let's move to the hyperbolic plane and try to describe um, uh, its uh, geometry with some very simple properties. So uh, it's, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, there was a, something I, I forgot to say. So we are going to be interested into length metric spaces. And this, uh, this is when, uh, when you have started with a metric space, you can define the length. But, uh, and then you can define a new distance, which is a distance between X and Y, which is going to be the length of the shortest geodesic. So in general, it is a different um, uh, metric than the one you started from. But um, the length spaces, uh, they exactly satisfy that the length, this length metric is the same as the original metric. So it turned out that if you start with a metric space, you consider the length metric space, then it stops here. The length metric spaces as it satisfies exactly this property. So this is not a very uh, difficult property. And we all know that it's important in, uh, that's a, in, in Riemannian geometry is, a, is, a, is an example of geometric uh, metrics, geodesic metric spaces. Well, uh, here I should say that you, again, you have to allow your distance to be infinite. Okay. So uh, let's try to explain the geodesic plane and try to explain uh, what are the axioms that could uh, lead to a description of, could lead to the uh, description of a ge the hyperbolic geometry by axioms, a little bit like Euclidean geometry. So first, there is a unique geodesic between two points, okay? Uh, but if you have a unique geodesic, this allows you to define uh, the midpoint. So what is the midpoint? So given X and Y, the midpoint, the middle point is just the point which is at equal along the, which is on the geodesic and which is at um, equal distance from X to Y. So there is another property uh, which I forgot to Right, which is the fact that any geodesic can be uniquely continued. That's a, again a important fact. 
So now, if you have a midpoint, and uh, then you can you can play you can construct from this midpoint some uh, some involution in your space, which is a symmetry. So what do you do? You take a point X and you have your uh, point M, which is going to be the center of your symmetry. Then, uh, from what I said before, it turns out there exists a unique point here, which I want to call sigma M of X, so that M is the middle point of sigma M on X. Okay, so in a, uh, in a general metric space, if you have this unique continuation of geodesics, and if you have a unique geodesic, uh, then it turns out that you have this natural a symmetry um, associated to any point in your uh, metric space. Okay, but now I'm going to impose a very important a condition: is that this symmetric space, this that which is the definition of a symmetric space, which is that this uh, symmetry preserves distance. I mean, there is no reason that this symmetry is an isometry. So I impose the extra condition that um, a symmetry, a point, a punctual symmetry preserves the distance. That's going to be to end up with a very small list of spaces which are called symmetric spaces. So let's impose an extra condition. So if they are expert on symmetric spaces in the room, I guess it might not be totally happy because I'm, what I said is not totally right. But let's 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 forget about that, please. And um, uh, right, then you have to say something about dimension two, and you can write this as a certain condition on the angles because I should have said that you can define also the angles between two geodesics. Okay, so uh, let's uh, be a little fast on this part. So a, it turned out when you add all these pro pro possibilities, you have only two possibilities. One is Euclidean plane, and the second one is exactly the hyperbolic plane. So how do you distinguish further these two objects, these two symmetric spaces, the Euclidean plane and the hyperbolic plane? So, uh, well, the point is really to build a model of the hyperbolic plane, but when you do that by whatever uh, model you prefer, you end up with an extra property. So first, you have a actually for the Euclidean plane, you also have a boundary at infinity. So what is a boundary at infinity? There is an extra relation between lines, which is to be asymptotic. So uh, your object is going to be um, or at a parallel distance. So your boundary at infinity is going to be the space of lines up to this relation, at the, relation of uh, equivalence. So the one property, uh, which is a very important hyperbolic geometry, is that given two points at infinity, you can realize, you can join this by two, uh, by two geodesics, by a geodesic between these two points, sorry. And uh, from that, you obtain some very important property, which is that in hyperbolic geometry, there exist infinite triangles. So what do I mean by infinite triangle? I mean that I have three geodesics. Uh, the lengths of each, they go to infinity. They are properly embedded. Um, they are a parallel, meaning that the two geodesics here, this geodesic here and this geodesic here, they are at finite distance. And that's about the condition. Right. And if you go to angle and uh, an area, uh, you can compute. So there's a very nice proof by Gauss uh, without doing any sort of uh, integral geometry that this uh, very area of this is pi. And um, it turned out also that the angle, if you can understand what is the angle of these two geodesics, they are, um, it is zero. Okay, so again, that's a very important property of hyperbolic geometry, that there exists a infinite triangles. So uh, from infinite triangle, you can actually do something which is very bad, which is uh, quite better, which is the fact that if you have uh, three positive numbers, and if the sum is less than pi, 
Then there exists the triangles with angle alpha, beta, and gamma. Okay, so a triangle here means that you have a you have a, three points on the geodesic joining them. Right, so this is going to solve a, a problem because a right angled hexagon exists in hyperbolic geometry. So how do you build a right angled hexagon? You just take a triangle, which you can build by the procedure I explained before, and the angle you ask them to be pi over four, pi over four here and here, and the center point is going to be pi over three. And the sum of that is less than pi. So if you add up uh, six of this triangle, so the uh, angle at the corner here is going to be pi over two, and you are going to obtain your uh, piece of hyperbolic geometry, your basic piece of our hyperbolic geometry, which is a right angled hexagon. So now uh, you are a, able to prove your result that any sort of the surfaces built out of pair of pants, that mean excluding the torus on the sphere, they can be built, uh, they can be equipped with a hyperbolic geometry. So you start with this right angle, you glue them back, exactly uh, how we did for the torus, and we obtain a pair of pants, which is hyperbolic, then a surface, you glue back the, the, the pair of pants and you obtain a, a, a surface which is hyperbolic. So what do I mean here by hyperbolic? It means that locally, any small ball in this space is going to look like a small ball in hyperbolic uh, plane. Okay, so that's my definition of a hyperbolic surface. Any small ball in my surface is isometric to a small ball in the hyperbolic space. So uh, they will have as my torus, as my uh, game of asteroids, which I explained before, uh, they will have a geometry, which is a, they will have lines, they will have angles, and they will have triangles. Okay, so we see, um, uh, we're going to see later that actually there are many hyperbolic surfaces. Okay, and I repeat here the definition, there are metric spaces with the same metric of the hyperbolic plane on small balls. So we have this notion of geodesics, which are locally the shortest length curve. And now you have also the notion of closed geodesic, which is at the geodesic that uh, go back, they are closed curve, but they are also geodesics. Okay. So here I emphasize that my geodesic here are really are going to be locally shorted length curve, not globally, of course, because that's certainly not true for a closed object. Right, so among this closed geodesic, I have the simple closed geodesics, which correspond to geodesics that do not self-intersect. So, so far, I have not shown, shown that there exists closed geodesic, and, and even more, that there exists simple closed geodesic. But here is a basic result of hyperbolic geometry that you start teaching your student when you teach them uh, hyperbolic geometry, that any time you pick a closed curve on a, on a hyperbolic surface, closed connected, then you can deform it to a closed geodesic. So, and moreover, uh, every, um, uh, this closed geodesic is unique. There is no two closed geodesic that are, can be deformed into uh, one another. So uh, this means that uh, the set of closed geodesic is the same as the same as closed curve up to deformation, and that object is a purely topological one. The same result hold, holds for simple curves. So every simple curve can be deformed in a simple geodesic. So let's introduce some a, a notation. So one is a set of closed geodesic, and I add this adjective primitive that you shouldn't be afraid of. It's just because I don't want, um, I, I want to count only, so to say, the images, meaning that if you take a geo closed geodesic, 
you can do, of course, you, you, there is another geodesic, closed geodesic, which is going twice around this geodesic. Okay. Um, I don't want, I want to discard those. So this is what I call primitive closed geodesic. The other kind of object, which I want to uh, consider is a set of simple uh, geodesics. And this is, of course, a subset of those primitive closed geodesics. Right, so this object, gamma and gamma sub s, they are actually uh, uh, just defined by the topology of your surface. So where does the hyperbolic, ge hyperbolic geometry comes? It comes when you define uh, this uh, spectrum. And um, is this spectrum, I'm sorry. Uh, the spectrum is that you can associate to every primitive closed geodesics you associate it just length, okay? So one of the basic results is that um, the number of closed geodesic of lengths smaller than L is finite. So if you have a sequence of closed geodesics of lengths, of bounded lengths, at some point it's going to be, it's, um, it's going to be cyclic, it's going to, um, well, just I'm making, uh, Complication, complication out of uh, the fact that uh, set is finite. So there is only finitely many closed geodesic of lengths smaller than something. Right. So uh, people have been interested for lots of reason into the asymptotic of this number n of l. So again, here n of l is a number of closed geodesic of lengths less than l. So um, um, the result for hyperbolic surfaces, and it actually holds in a, in a more generality, not only for surfaces, but in higher dimensional space, is a, this asymptotic. The number, this number is asymptote to exponential of L divided by 2L. So I added the pictures of uh, Margulis and Bowen because they are the one who proved the, the um, more general version, let's say to say. But this has a much longer history than just uh, Margulis and Bowen. So the other properties is that now that you want to consider closed, uh, simple geodesics. And you want to count now the number of simple curves. And it was a, a result by uh, John Berman and uh, Caroline Series, Caroline Series, that this now this does not have exponential growth, but it has polynomial growth. There is only um, right. So the, this number is bounded by some polynomial. So they have some very nice uh, result how to explain why this is bounded by polynomials, but they didn't have a the correct polynomial. So this is what uh, Mariam uh, did. And it's going to be a special case of a more general result, which I will try to explain, that if you take a hyperbolic surface, then the number of simple closed curve is asymptotic to L to the 3P times V of sigma. So what is P here? It's an integral number, which is precisely the number of pair of pants uh, that you use to build your surface sigma. And the other thing here is something which depends only on the Euler characteristic, of course, for the experts. And this constant V of sigma, I'm not going to say uh, more than that. It's a constant only depending on the hyperbolic geometry of sigma. So, um, of course, uh, what is important is this result is to have the explicit V of sigma, but I would just want to give you a flavor of this uh, result. So, um, right, so I'm going to explain a little more about this result, and I want Russia? to, yep. What is the twiddle in your statement? It means that uh, ratio, is uh, ratio goes to one. Hmm. It's not a standard. Yes, well, as L, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right. Yeah, I should have said, this is always when L goes to infinity, and the asymptotic is when L goes to infinity. So this is something that we use in French uh, uh, high school, so I'm not sure. Uh, it's, uh, it just means that the ratio of the two quantity goes to one. Thank you. Sorry, thank you for uh, make me, making me clarify. 
So um, now I have to explain uh, more about the space of all hyperbolic surfaces. So the first thing is that my, uh, my construction have been very uh, simple, but it turned out there are many pair of fans and there are many pair of hyperbolic pair of fans. And because and there are many hyperbolic pair of fans because there are many uh, right angled hexagons. They come in a whole family. So here's the result that you have to prove that for all, anytime you take A, B, C positive number, then you have a right angle hexagons so that this, 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 this side is, uh, length of this side is A, I'm sorry, the length of this side is B and the length of this side is uh, C. And then if you glue them together, so I'm afraid that this picture is, um, is not right. So you have to glue along this side, of course, and then you obtain pair of pens which have length 2A, 2B, and 2C. So if you count, you see that you have three degrees of freedom of building a, pair, a hyperbolic pair of pens. And these three degrees of freedom are exactly these three numbers, A, B, C. Okay. So now you have actually also a lot of gluing. So it's a little bit harder to see. So imagine that you have your sewing curves here, and then you can, you can move around, you can twist around this a uh, little bit. So anytime you have a curve in your surface, um, uh, you have a, an extra degree of freedom, which is to rotate. You don't want maybe this red point to be exactly in front of this one. You want it to be here or something like that. So that's going to give different hyperbolic surfaces. I mean, you can, you, you can see, I mean, you, this is again something that you have to prove. So in the end, you have exactly 3p degrees of freedom for building a hyperbolic surface. So let's now be a little more precise about uh, the space that we are going to be interested in. So the first one is Riemann moduli space. So Riemann moduli space is a space of hyperbolic surfaces with p pans divided up to isometries. We said that two hyperbolic surfaces are the same whenever they are isometric. And uh, so this is a pretty complicated space. And uh, you may want to fix an extra data. And one extra data is this decomposition into pair of pens. So here you see that the corresponding object, hyperbolic surfaces with P pens with a fixed decomposition of pair of pens. Now that's exactly as we, as we said, it's uh, R to the 3P of the two. So we have the length, which are parameters, and then you have this twisting parameter, which look like S1. So this object is exactly going to be that. What people actually uh, prefer is the cover of this one, universal cover of this one, and this correspond to not only a fixing a pair of pants, but what is a, a uh, 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 you fix you fix one decomposition pair of pens and you fix extra curves, which are blue in this picture here. And this uh, com the the what is left are uh, hexagons. So now this object really is a, is a, is R to the three P, and this object is called a uh, Teichmuller space. So of course you have a natural map from the Teichmuller space to Riemann moduli space, which is to forget about the markings of the extra data, okay? So you obtain a map, which is from uh, some object which is topologically simple to some object which is Riemann moduli space, which is topologically complicated. And the relation between these two objects is given by the mapping class group. So formally, the mapping class group is given by the space of a, homeomorphism of the space of connected components of homomorphism of sigma preserving the orientation. So this mapping class group is going to act on the space of markings, which, which are just topological objects. And the quotient of Teichmuller space by the mapping class group is going to be Riemann moduli space. So this action is very important, but we are going to uh, look at some other action, which is the action of the mapping class group on the set of simple curves. 
Okay, so we have to first to give example of that, and um, and um, then to explain um, uh, Marianne Mirzahani result. So a more a, a very important of uh, an important element of the mapping class group are the so-called dent twist with respect to a simple curve. So let's imagine you have a simple curve gamma here. Then you have a little annulus around gamma. So you take off this annulus. And then, uh, so I'm, I've drawn a, uh, this original curve here. And then I a, perform a twist like that um, of exactly um, a two pi twist. And I glue back this. So what happens with my simple curves? So let's say this curve eta, and I, my curve eta is going to be exactly like this curve in my annulus. So I twist it, and I obtain a new curve, which is going to go around once my original curve gamma. And you can repeat this procedure, and you, you uh, obtain uh, lots of different curves. So I've ju just explained you how a dent twist acts on gamma. So it turns out that the mapping class group is actually generated by this dent twist. So these dent twists are sort of elementary building blocks for the mapping class group. Although they are, the, the way they built the mapping class group is pretty complicated. So again, I'm going to start with a little uh, animation here of how a dent twist can uh, dent twist can work. So you take gamma here, right? So you take your blue curve and you take out the annulus, you twist it around and you glue it back to the new curve. You can repeat the procedure with twist two, three times. Then if you do something that doesn't intersect, nothing happens. And something more complicated may happen in other examples. So I've done some other examples here, right? So you see that this picks this curve is actually very different from the original one. So the action of your uh, uh, mapping class group on a space of curves, if of simple curves, is pretty complicated. So I just repeat the animation one more time. So when you do not intersect the curves, which is going to be uh, now, nothing happens. And then uh, you can actually remove a twist. And uh, well, something more complicated may happen when you have two uh, intersections. OK. So uh, what is the result of Marianne Mizahani now? I'm sorry, this is not very friendly. It's again, uh, you want to count the number of a simple closed curve in an orbit of the mapping class group. So you start with a curve gamma, zero, and you applied your mapping class group to it. So you have infinitely many simple curves generated by the process, for instance, I explained for the then twist. And now you want to count just the number of those curves gamma whose length is less than n. And the result is that, uh, again, this is asymptotic when L goes to infinity, to L to the 3p, V of sigma, it's the same constant as before. But now, of course, this depends on uh, the curve gamma zero that you start from. So you have a, a constant, uh, you have a, constant, which depends on the topology of your curve. So that's a very important counting result. And uh, it's a very helpful for us. So a um, um, inner PhD, uh, that's how I came to, to know her. Uh, Marianne Mizahani has shown a conjecture which was by Witten on the topologically on the topology of this Riemann moduli space. I said before, this is a very simple object, and this is a complicated object. And this, this is topologically complicated. And in particular, it has lots of uh, um, characteristic classes and uh, kind of that. So uh, we then had the conjecture, which has proved by Konsevich. I think uh, this was one of the reasons why Konsevich got the field medal. And, uh, and uh, Marianne gave another proof. So, uh, she is considering another kind of uh, object, which is a moduli space, uh, Riemann moduli space, the space of hyperbolic surfaces. But here you have some numbers. This means that you count only, you are only going to be interested in surfaces with boundary uh, made out of p-pens. 
and such that the length of the boundary is L1, L2, L1. And this is up to isometry, okay? So that's another moduli space, which is quite, quite important. And the idea is that you can, uh, um, uh, Mirzahani recursion formula, oh, uh, sorry, I should have said something. And what is quite important here, but I didn't have time to precise, that these objects have volumes. They are finite volumes. And one of the main conjectures of the subject was to understand what is the volume of these spaces. And what Mariam did was to obtain a recursion formula for these volumes. So this looks pretty complicated, the way it is written, but it is actually not that terrible. So let's just consider this first term here. So um, you have to think of this object as a, um, so first you see that you reduce the number of pair of pens. Here you have P plus one pair of pens, and then you have just P pair of pens. And you sort of reduced your uh, computation of volumes to a volume of uh, objects which have uh, less pair of pens, Q, Q prime, P. So you have Q plus Q prime is equal to P. So all these objects have less pair of pens. And then there is a, some sort of convolution formula that helps you compute this volume. Right. So how do you see this form, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this sum here? It's just a really a topological uh, a thing, it meaning that you take your surface with P plus one pair of pants, and then you, you remove a pair of pants uh, out of a one boundary component. Then you kind of, of see topologically that there are several cases. So first, uh, what is left is connected. So that's going to correspond to this term. Right, so you add two extra, uh, bond uh, two extra uh, boundary component, and then you can. Um, the other thing that you can have is that uh, you can have uh, this is not connected, and then the sum is indexed by the number of boundary components, say on this side. So the total number of boundary components here, you know what it is. It is it is uh, n minus one. But uh, you may have a decomposition, which is like that. So this sum is pretty complicated, but you understand it better when you see that this is a first some sort of convolution formula here, for instance, and uh, this is related to a topological uh, decomposition. So again, this formula has been very important. So it has given rise to a subject which is uh, called topological recursion by Enar and Orantin. And they have shown that this kind of phenomenon appear very often. And for her, this was a tool to prove this Wisden's conjecture. From this a, um, a formula, she got, uh, uh, she got access to the, uh, to uh, the characteristic numbers. So that's a uh, difficult, to explain uh, right now. But what I want to emphasize is that there is this very simple picture here of this decomposition of a surface into smaller pieces. And you can see that this gives rise to some um, uh, recursion formula, which is like that. Right, so finally, I'm going to, uh, to move to uh, one last work of Mariam which is uh, the dynamics of the rational billiard. So what is the rational billiard? It is a locally Euclidean surface, which is built out of some stupid game. You take a, you take a polygon in, uh, let's say a polygon, uh, to be simple, let's say a square polygon in uh, a rectangle polygon in, uh, in R2. And then you glue, you do the same thing as you do for tori, which is that you glue, uh, for instance, this side to this side, this side to this side, this side to this side, and this side to this side. So what happens is that inside the, this is going to fill completely your surface. Uh, so you will have lines on that, but uh, you see that all these red dots, they are going to give rise to the same point. And it turned out that now the total angle is going to be, uh, it's not going to be two pi. So why is it so? Because you see that, I'm sorry, there is a mistake in this formula. I, 
I change it. So there is five, one, two, three, four, five, five pi over two. Okay. There is two pi. So there's one pi here, one pi here. Okay. And then there is this guy, which is three pi over two. I'm sorry why I wrote pi over four. Anyway, uh, the answer, the last uh, object is correct. It's six pi. And uh, you can you can compute um, using the gauss bonnet formula that this surface now is actually a surface which is made out of four pair, pair of bands. So it's kind of a funny exercise to build a four pair of bands from um, this picture of a L-shaped polygon. So I'll leave you uh, do that as an exercise. So, uh, right, so this, oh, okay, so here's the correct formula. This is 5 pi over 2 plus 2 pi plus uh, 1 times 3 pi over 2. Right, so these are Euclidean sur surfaces and they are called rational billiards exactly because you can play some sort of a weird billiard on them. So it means that you start with these curves, the geodesics line, it goes here, and then suddenly goes here and then appears here. And this, I think, is I'm defining a closed. Um, a closed geodesic here. So what is very important is that now, if you consider the space of billiard as a space, then there is an action of, first an action of R. So what is this action? You start with a polygon and you multiply all the length, all the vertical local length by T, and you divide all the horizontal length, A, B, and C, by T. So you obtain a new billiard. Okay, uh, it's not totally new because it's of course related to the previous one, but uh, these two objects are not isometric. So you have, I define here the action of R, but actually this is not an action, this can be extended to an action of SL2R because uh, you can actually rotate your polygon and obtain a new polygon. Right. So uh, the result of uh, uh, Eskin, uh, Mirzakhani, and Mohammadi is a classification of all invariant measures by SL2R and for uh, the uh, space of, uh, of uh, rational billiards. So this is a very difficult uh, theorem. And it's an analog of the theorem of Marina Ratner, uh, which is very important in uh, homogeneous dynamics. Um, right, so I'll try to explain this a little more precise. So it turns out that the space of rational billiards have some natural coordinates, which is given by the length of some curves. And the result of this classification is to say that these invariant measures that you have, they are actually affine with respect to these coordinates. Right, so uh, I'm going to uh, finish my, a, my uh, talk by a, making some advertisements. So if you want to learn more about mathematics, there is a beautiful paper by Alex Wright, who was a collaborator of Marianne and, um, uh, in Stanford in the built-in of the AMS. And uh, the paper is called A Tour through Mizahani's work on the modulized space of Riemann surfaces. So that's a, a nice, a, it's a beautiful paper and um, that gives way more than I am I've just explained for this colloquium. Then there are, if you're interested in a softer uh, uh, information about Mariam Mizahani, there are very good articles in uh, Wired and also in Quanta. And there is a short movie, which is called a Tenacious Explorer, and which is uh, on the website of Quanta. And um, this is very uh, illuminating about, uh, actually, also about our life. And uh, I'm going to uh, finish by a picture. So this is uh, Maria Mizahani in a conference in uh, Lumini. And this is Greg McShane. So I like this picture because uh, the uh, formula of McShane was very important in proving this uh, uh, Mirsahani uh, um, recursion formula. So I'm afraid I've, uh, I'm a little uh, earlier than I should be. 
um, let me uh, show you um, again this um, this animation to show you how complicated be the mapping class group, the action of the mapping class group on the space of simple curve can be, and uh, why uh, Miriam Maz Mirzahani uh, insight have been very helpful for us uh, to understand these actions on the mapping class group on the space of curves, then on Tashman space itself. So a uh, thank you for your attention.